Welcome to Moriel TV. My name is Joshua, live with James Jacob Prash in Holland, December 7th, 2018, for This Week in Prophecy. Jacob. Blessings in Jesus, dear friends. Our apologetic regrets for the delay of This Week in Prophecy for the first week of December. So many events have been transpiring, particularly in the Middle East, but also in Europe and at the G20 summit, that the outcome of these events was not adequately known for us to examine them in light of scripture in terms of their full prophetic impact. So we had to wait for something of the aftermath in order to proceed. But let's begin this week in prophecy. This week in prophecy, actually it was last week, a meeting was concluded between Pope Francis and Ahmoud Abbas of the Palestinian Authority. As you may remember, the Vatican objected to the United States relocating its embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. And this, again, illustrates that the Vatican has always had political designs, not just religious designs, on Israel and on the final status of Jerusalem. It has had since the time of the Crusades, um, with a very, very long-running memory with the Latin Patriarchate in Jerusalem. We've spoken of this before. But this particular Pope Francis was openly critical in the political sphere of the policies of the United States and of the Trump administration, and its support for Israel demonstrated in the final relocation of the embassy to Jerusalem, which had been allocated by Congress many years ago, but just never took place due to political pressures. The Pope expressed concern about the final status of Jerusalem, and the Vatican continues to push for an internationalization of that city. Now, we've warned the Antichrist will come and bring a false peace to the Middle East. If we read Revelation 11 carefully, it is entirely possible that a tribulational temple will coexist next to the Mosque of Omar. The mosque does not necessarily have to come down. This depends on which school of archaeology we follow. Is it the school of archaeology of Dr. Dan Bahat, which would mean that the Mosque of Omar would have to come down, that is the Dome of the Rock, or the school of the late Professor Asher Kaufman, which would mean it is 70 meters to the north in a direct alignment with the cleft of the Mount of Olives at the location of the present East Gate, which was built on the site of the original East Gate. Now, this is a technical argument archaeologically, whether or not the East Gate, the Beautiful Gate, and then the Counter Gate are the same gate or different gates. Nonetheless, One interpretation of Revelation 11, the outer court has been given to the Gentiles, would allow for some kind of an internationalization and a multi-faith arrangement for the old city. With Christendom, I would call it Christendom, having its holy place in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, and the Jews and Muslims dividing the Temple Mount. Remember, the end of the time of the Gentiles will not formally conclude in its entirety as long as the Temple Mount is in any degree held by Muslims or held by non-Jews, for that matter, until the Lord Jesus comes. There are prophecies concerning this in the book of Isaiah and elsewhere. The book of Daniel, however, is most focal. The time of the Gentiles ultimately is bound up with the displacement of non-Jewish presence from the Temple Mount. In the Mosque of Omar, You have these embossed two demonic figures naturally occurring in the marble, which we've spoken of various times. And also the quotation from a surah in the Quran that God has no son. Allah is not begotten, neither does he beget, which from 1 John is, of course, an antichrist doctrine, denying the father-son relationship. But we see the Vatican's role in trying to promote this kind of false peace. It is not a new idea, but it is being galvanized under the present Pope. And it took place this week in prophecy. This week in prophecy, the semi-rogue state of the Persian Gulf has announced its withdrawing from OPEC, in effect. Qatar is a small oil producer, but it is a major liquid gas producer, essentially the largest in the world certainly the largest in the Gulf, although a small country. They are in an ongoing dispute with Saudi Arabia and with the Emirates, but in a very complicated situation. On one hand, they are friendlier to Iran than any of the other Sunni regimes that are on the 
western shore of the Persian Gulf, which irritates the Emirates in Saudi Arabia. On the other hand, they allow an American operational base to take place from there. The United States is flying F-22 missions over Iraq and Syria out of a base in Qatar as one of the bases of operations. Very complicated situation. But the Qatar has essentially said that Saudi Arabia controls OPEC. It's a one nation control, which in effect is a reality. But they've left OPEC. Whether or not this is the first sign of OPEC cracking, we cannot be sure. But this week in prophecy, the United States is attempting to broker in Sweden peace talks between the Iranian backed Houthis and the Yemen government. These have had incursions and spillover effects into southern Saudi Arabia, the Saudi Arabians backing the Yemen government against the Houthis, who are Iranian leaning and are part and parcel of the Sunni Shia dispute. The United States around, arranged for 10,000 Houthi wounded to be removed from Yemen, but it's pushed Yemen to the brink of famine. It's pushed the country itself to the very brink of famine. The key factor in this is, will the Houthis speak for themselves or they simply be mouthpieces for Iran? The United States is key to keep a stability in southern Saudi Arabia or anywhere in that region where the entrance to the Gulf of Persia or the Persian Gulf can be compromised. That is the background to what is happening, as well as the potential humanitarian disaster of which Yemen is already on the brink. In the meantime, there has been a further deployment of Russian S-400 missiles in Zankoy Air Base in Crimea, but also operational near Damascus in Syria. We've been reporting that there is a strange parallelism between what is happening in the Ukraine and what is happening in the Middle East. The United States and Israel have both been flying advanced jets with advanced avionic systems along the Ukrainian-Russian border. The Ukrainian parliament this week voted to rescind the friendship treaty with Russia. This follows the naval confrontation and the seizure of ships in the Black Sea but this is heating up. There is a buildup now of these S-400 missiles in the Crimea, which was annexed by Russia. The United States has announced for the first time in a month it is sending additional naval warships into the Black Sea under freedom of navigation. It is told the Turkish government it is planning to send ships through the Dardanelles into the area or near the area that's been in dispute. The same time things are heating up in the Ukraine, they are heating up in Syria between the United States and Syria and between the United States and Russia. Watch this very carefully. The Americans and Israelis are using the Ukraine as a proxy training ground for a possible confrontation in Syria. This week in prophecy has seen the funeral of George Bush Sr. George Bush Sr. is a commensurate establishment Republican. He was no friend of evangelicals in any real sense of the word, and he was not a conservative. George Bush Sr. was Ronald Reagan's vice president, and he was the price that Reagan had to pay to get the nomination to become the president. It was Bush Sr. who essentially ran most of Ronald Reagan's foreign policy. He staffed it with establishment Republicans, such as James Baker and the State Department and Caspar Weinberger, who was Secretary of Defense and who was later indicted, but Bush Sr. pardoned him. If there's any man who should have died in federal prison, it was probably Caspar Weinberger. Be that as it may, Mr. Bush was no friend of, of 
conservative Christian values, and he was no friend of Israel. What he was was a pawn of Saudi Arabia. The Saudi Arabians carried him in their back pocket. There is no question that during the Iran-Contra scandal, when the United States was secretly involved in transferring weapons to Iran, that Ronald Reagan denied and then pled senility under oath concerning that it was orchestrated by Mr. Bush Sr. Again, he's going to be buried in the United States in Texas. In my opinion, he should be buried in Mecca. That is where his true loyalties were always found. He said, Saudi Arabians are our friends. While they were arresting, flogging, hanging, and decapitating Christians. Mr. Bush Sr. said, these people are our friends. It was all about the politics of oil. It was Mr. Bush Sr. who left Saddam Hussein in power in 1991, only for his son to remove Saddam Hussein from power in the aftermath of September 11th. There may have been arguments to have left Saddam Hussein in power in 1991, but then to try to remove him at a later point without any plan to extricate the United States from Iraq was an absolute mess. He should have been gotten rid of if America was going to get rid of him in 1991 when most of the world, including the Arab world, was on America's side because of the invasion of Kuwait. Again, the Bush family has never been anything but a political cancer for the interests of the United States. Neil Bush was at the center of the SNL catastrophe, savings and loan catastrophe, that wound up costing the American taxpayers more than the Vietnam War. This family, who some people say was skull and crossbones and things of this nature. You were both in skull and bones, the secret society. It's so secret we can't talk about it. What does that mean for America? The conspiracy theorists are going to go watch. I'm sure they are. I don't know. I haven't seen the record. Number 322? <laughs> uh, first of all, he's not the nominee. And, uh, but, uh, look, I look for Are you prepared to lose? No, I'm not going to lose. You both were members of Skull and Bones, a secret society at Yale. What does that tell us? Uh, not much, because it's a secret. <laughs> Is there a secret handshake? Is there a secret code? I wish there were something secret I could manifest. 322? A secret number? Uh, there are all kinds of secrets, Tim, but one thing is not a secret. I disagree with this president's direction that he's taking the country. We can do a better job, and I intend to do it. And we'll be watching the Safe on the Campaign Trail. John Kerry, thanks yes, for joining us, and we'll be right back. May or may not be true. I basically believe it is true that they were skull and crossbones from that secret organization in New Haven, Connecticut, where some of the most eminent graduates of Yale attended it. Not that I'm a conspiracy theorist. But what is no doubt is this. It was Mr. Bush, who died this week in prophecy, who coined the phrase, New World Order. Out of these troubled times, our fifth objective, a new world order can emerge, a new era. An era in which the nations of the world, East and West, North and South, can prosper and live in harmony. And today that new world is struggling to be born. A world quite different from the one we've known. A world where the rule of law supplants the rule of the jungle. A world in which nations recognize the shared responsibility for freedom and justice. A world where the strong respect the rights of the weak. We have before us the opportunity to forge for ourselves and for future generations a new world order. A world where the rule of law, not the law of the jungle, governs the conduct of nations. When we are successful, and we will be, we have a real chance at this new world order an order in which a credible United Nations can use its peacekeeping role to fulfill the promise and vision of the UN's founders. What is at stake is more than one small country. It is a big idea, a new world order, where diverse nations are drawn together in common cause to achieve the universal aspirations of mankind.
peace and security, freedom and the rule of law. Such is a world worthy of our struggle and worthy of our children's future. Now we can see a new world coming into view. A world in which there is the very real prospect of a new world order. In the words of Winston Churchill, a world order in which the principles of justice and fair play protect the weak against the strong. A world where the United Nations, freed from Cold War stalemate, is poised to fulfill the historic vision of its founders. I have no respect for that man's legacy whatsoever, except that he fought for the United States as a naval pilot in the Second World War. I must respect his war record. He did fight for the country at that time. But as a politician, he did America nothing but harm, politically, economically, and otherwise. The reason the Reagan administration was not truly a conservative administration was because of his co-pilot, George Bush Sr., who died this week in prophecy. This week in prophecy, quite a week once again, let's continue. The G20 summit ended in Argentina. There were trade talks about imbalances between the United States and Angela Merkel and Mr. Trump met with her concerning Germany's trade imbalance with the United States. But the main outcome was discussions between Mr. Trump and Mr. Ping of China in an attempt to end the trade war. China has allowed for further discussions, as the United States has, concerning the theft of intellectual property. But no matter what China says, you cannot trust or believe China. Mr. Trump is shrewd enough to be aware of that. He needs substance. The substance has been they have removed the excessive tariffs on the importation of American automobiles, which are very popular in China and will indeed help Detroit and the automobile industry, bearing in mind that it was the blue collar voting population of states like Michigan that were in large part responsible for Mr. Trump's being elected over the Clinton machine and of overcoming the Bush machine within his own party. He beat both dynasties, but he did so with the backing of the blue collar vote. If nothing else, he's loyal to his constituency and supporters. We shall see the outcome of the trade war ending with China, but it did send Wall Street shares soaring. Once again, this week in prophecy. We've often said the rumors about things being found or discovered of biblical significance archaeologically in Israel or the Middle East are wildly exaggerated, sometimes fabricated. Sometimes it is borders on lunacy. And our basic gold standard has been, if it's not in biblical archaeology review, don't believe it. When scholars for the Albright Institute or for the Department of Antiquities of Hebrew University, etc., make any major discoveries, Biblical Archaeology Review reports it. If it's not in the BAR, don't believe it. But this week in prophecy, something significant took place. For the first time, Biblical Archaeology Review spoke of the Ark of a Covenant possibly being in Ethiopia and Az Aksum, near Lake Timna, on an island called Timakirkus Island, in a church dedicated to Mary, of all things, where there's one monk who lives in isolation as a hermit until another one is appointed at his death, who calls himself the guardian of the ark. The Ethiopian Coptic church has always believed the ark is there. For the first time, Biblical Archaeology Review has lent some credence to the possibility of it happening that the ark was translated, uh, sorry, the ark was transported up the Nile before the destruction of the first temple. If this ark was ever discovered, 
and it was in any kind of pact, bearing in mind it's covered with non-oxidizing gold, such an artifact would in itself give massive impetus to the rebuilding of the temple. We are not saying it's there in Ethiopia, although we've heard it before for many decades, it was claimed to be there. Haile Selassie, who claimed to be a descendant of King Solomon and the Queen of Sheba, Mount Gesheva, claimed it was there. But serious archaeologists from Israel, from the Department of Antiquities, from Biblical Archaeology Review, from the Albright Institute, etc., never lent much credence to such claims. For the first time, they've said they cannot dismiss the possibility. It doesn't mean anything more than it's a possibility, but it is a possibility, according to Biblical Archaeology Review, as published this week in Prophecy. This week in Prophecy, further major developments in the Middle East. Benjamin Netanyahu flew to Brussels for emergency meetings with American Secretary of State Mike Pompeo. The impetus for the emergency meetings were the testing by Iran of the Khorram Shar multi-reentry vehicle missile that could hit several targets at the same time. It is what the Americans used to call a MIRV, and it has a significant range capable of actually hitting Europe or anywhere in the Middle East. The United States and Israel and Saudi Arabia are all maintaining its contrary to UN Resolution 2231. It is based on technology from the Wasong 10 missile of Saudi Arabia, highlighting again, as we and others have reported, there has been secret defense and cooperation that's not so secret between the regime of North Korea and Iran. The Iranians had money, the North Koreans stole technology. But let's understand this even further. Where is the money coming from? Who is paying for this weapons development? The answer is Barack Obama and John Kerry. The $150 billion released by the Obama administration into the hands of Iranians who are sponsoring terror, who are having Americans killed by radical militias in Afghanistan, who are sponsoring terror action against the United States and Iraq, did not prevent the Obama administration from betraying America, from betraying Saudi Arabia, Israel, Jordan, and the Emirates by putting $150 billion dollars into the hands of this insane regime, even while it was killing Americans and threatening our allies. Well, predictably, they've invested the money in weapons development, not in infrastructure or helping their increasingly impoverished people. This week in Prophecy. Again, George Bush Sr. was not a good man. Barack Obama was not a good man. We must pray that Mr. Trump will be. So far, in many ways, he has been. I cannot overstate the importance of prayer for the president and the administration. The betrayals of America and its interests and its allies that took place under the Obama regime are almost unbelievable. Some people would describe them as treasonous, and it would be difficult to argue. Certainly, morally tantamount to treason, in the opinion of anybody who looks at the ramifications of what Barack Obama and John Kerry actually did, as well as Hillary Clinton when she was Secretary of State, who began this process. But let's continue. Oddly, while Russia has been backing Iran with technology and selling weapons and weapon systems to Iran. There's been something of a rapprochement between Saudi Arabia and Russia. Mr. Putin met with Saudi officials and agreed to curtail oil production in both countries, pushing the price of crude up another 4%. Again, the effect of fracking and the effect of other gluts has pushed the price of oil down 
as the Saudi Arabians increase production under pressure from Donald Trump. Now it is beginning to go the other way again. This may create more domestic pressure for the United States to build the pipeline that is so opposed by a number of interests, not just environmentalists, but the investments in railroads by Warren Buffett using rail cars to transport Canadian oil to the United States and to American refineries instead of a pipeline. I like trains, I like railroads, but I also like what's best for the American consumer. I'm concerned for the environment, but there's no proof a pipeline is a major danger to the environment if properly managed. There's been no major pipeline disasters as such as you've had with offshore rigs or as if you had with the Esso Valdez or certain tanker ships. There's also been train wrecks involving gasoline-carrying tanker cars. Be that as it may, this week in prophecy, the oil markets are again heading up after coming down. We shall see what will happen. Let's push on. This week in prophecy, major news. On the 29th of November, for about 75 minutes, approximately an hour and a quarter, Israel targeted Iranian and Hezbollah targets inside Syria, in the Golan, in the Damascus region, and in southern Syria. One target was actually hit at the foot of Mount Hermon within visible distance of Israeli observation posts on the Golden Heights. Targets were also hit in the Kenitra region. Now, as we've been reporting, the United States Air Force has been flying F-22s around the clock over Syria before the Russian S-400s and S-300s and advanced radar systems become fully operational. General Kenneth McKenna, commander of the American Central Command said that these missiles are a threat to American planes and to American lives. He said it this week in prophecy. Will the American around the clock air operations continue once these missiles are deployed, uh, are fully deployed or not is the question. What we do know is this. If the missiles are fired, they cannot be fired without the assistance of Russians. Syria or Iran do not have the technical skills to operate those systems without Russian military advisors. Could this push to a further potential conflict between the United States and Russia? The answer is, in theory, it certainly could. But right now, the Americans are continuing their round-the-clock operations. Again, some of the flights flying from Qatar, others undoubtedly from Cyprus, and others from the deck of the USS Harry Truman. Meanwhile, Iran has announced that it is training Afghanis, Afghan militants, Taliban, to fight American forces in Syria and elsewhere. Iran has also said it has the capacity to fire up to 700 kilometers with, with the capacity of hitting United States vessels in the Sixth Fleet, the Mediterranean Fleet, including the Truman. That's what they said. In response, though, the United States has sent another carrier, not into the Eastern Mediterranean, but into the orifice of the Persian Gulf, the USS Stennis. Now off the Iranian coast, American aircraft carrier, in response to the Iranian threats. What has happened is Mr. Rouhani has announced this week in prophecy that if Iran can't sell oil, it will not allow oil to be sold by anyone else in the Persian Gulf. Is he bluffing or is he just frustrated because of the economic impact the American oil sanctions have had commencing the 4th of November? 
it is obviously affecting the economy of Iran. And had not not had they not received 150 billion dollars, courtesy of Barack Obama and John Kerry, the impact would be even worse, considerably worse, most likely. Meanwhile, however, the S-300 are not yet an operational system, but late January is not very far away. In light of these round-the-clock F-22 missions being flown by the United States over Syria, Iranian deliveries of weapons, supplies, and munition to Hezbollah and to Iranian forces inside Syria are being routed via Beirut, where the Shia regime of Nasrallah, the Sheikh Nasrallah, arch enemy of Israel, holds significant sway with the present Lebanese government. This has been a major factor in the attempt to construct invasion tunnels into northern Israel, into the area of Metula and Kiryat Shmona. This week, the Israelis have begun to destroy those two tunnels of the kind that had previously only come from Gaza into Israel. A second tunnel was discovered and is also under wreckage by the Israeli military and Israeli engineers. Israel has complained to the United Nations. The UN UNIFIL forces were supposed to prevent anything, anything that would allow for cross-border operations against Israel from taking place. Mr. Netanyahu has complained to the UN Secretary General Gutierrez of the failure of UNIFIL to fulfill its obligation. The hint is Israel will again re-enter southern Lebanon to protect its borders if it has to. But there has been a threat to northern Israel with the construction of these tunnels. Hezbollah has not stopped or abided by the ceasefire agreement. Russia gave a passive agreement to Israel to take what action it needed to defend its northern border in a public statement. That is clear. But there is also no question that Russia would like to see Israel's capacity to engage in defense operations stretched as thin as possible from Gaza in the south to not only the Golan Heights in the north, but a third front, as it were, in Lebanon. This is the interest of Iran. It is the probable interest of Russia. It is certainly the interest of Syria. This week in prophecy. This week in prophecy, Iran has targeted Hezbollah in the Golan, Damascus, and something called the House of Glass in Laura. These intense missile attacks by the Israelis this week in prophecy largely focused on Iranian and Iranian-aligned targets, hitting the Golan, Damascus, the Kunitra region, and the command center of Iranian Republican Guard operations in Syria, known as the Glass House, were carried out by the LoRa system. The LoRa system are essentially a combination of artillery and rocket technology. They have artillery-type shells that are rocket-propelled. A total of 15 sites were hit within an hour and a quarter. And the largest of these was the Al Zabdani supply base, which may be a reason that the Iranians have already begun routing their resupplies to the Republican Guards via Lebanon and Beirut International Airport. Meanwhile, in the Il Kiswa, the glass house was left in ruins. The Israelis may have killed as many as 30 Iranians and Hezbollah. It is undisclosed how many Syrians may also have been killed, or if or not any Russian military advisors were killed, this is unknown. But certainly 30 Iranian and uh, Iranian-aligned, largely Hezbollah, were killed in these 
15 attacks or 15 targeted areas. This was largely underreported in the international press, but it is highly significant this week in prophecy. With Iran training Afghanis to fight in Syria, as well as inside of Afghanistan against Americans, General Yoel Strik, Israeli commander of the Northern Command, said that once again, this was made possible by the financial funding provided to Iran by the Obama administration. Kasef Sulami is directing these operations. In the meantime, something else begins to take place in this regard. There is a Sunni population in Baluchistan inside of Iran. The entire country is not Shia, most of it is. The Baluchians are ethnically different than the Persians or the Arabs but they have sympathies to radical Sunni Islam. They have struck at a target in Iran in a suicide attack, killing four of their own, doing an undisclosed amount of damage. The precedent and importance of this is that the Sunni-Shia conflict now is taking place inside of Iran itself. On top of Iran's economic problems, the precedent has been set for internal terror involving the Sunni-Shia conflict that goes back to the Battle of Karbala in the 8th century. Absolutely remarkable. The same time this week in prophecy, Turkey is blaming the Crown Prince of the United Arab Emirates, among others, for the Khashoggi affair. This has led to indictments in Turkey and to a severe diplomatic row between Turkey and Saudi Arabia who are vying for control of the Sunni world, certainly at least the Sunni Middle East in terms of politically domineering influence. The Saudi Arabians having the oil and the money, Turkey having the size and the power. Let's continue looking. The Turks, the Ottoman Empire, subjugated their fellow Muslims, the Arabs, into a serfdom, treating them as little more than slaves. Again, undermining Islamic claims of justice to be found in the doctrine of Ummah, that Muslims are one nation and one people. The Ottoman Turks dominated the Arabs. The Arabs resented them. As we've said before, this was the background for T.E. Lawrence, Lawrence of Arabia. But again, memories in the Middle East run very, very long. There is more to the Khashoggi affair than the killing of Khashoggi. It is a power struggle between Turkey and the Arab Emirates in Saudi Arabia. The political row is a reflection of something much, much deeper. It's not simply a legal conflict or even a political one. It is an absolute power struggle using proxies, using money, using law, using diplomacy, using anything they can in a very confused area of the world. Muslim against Muslim. As the scripture tells us, God will send the spirit of confusion among Israel's enemies. And they are confused. This week in prophecy, in a furious speech made to the Kud party supporters, Harosh Shalah, the Prime Minister of Israel, Benjamin Netanyahu, accused the police of pursuing a politically motivated prosecution of himself in the Bezik electrical scandal allegations that political bribes were paid in the form of 
government regulations that were favorable to Bezik, a communications company, in exchange for political support in the media. We've pointed out multiple times, this is not unlike what happens in the United States where you have the Mueller investigation and other politically motivated attempts to attack the Trump administration for the same kinds of reasons. They lost the election and cannot win politically or democratically, so they will attempt to use the judicial system as a weapon against their political adversaries who they could not defeat at the ballot box. This week in prophecy, something else being played down, especially by the Pentagon. The commander of U.S. naval forces in the Persian Gulf during this crucial time of the specter of conflict with Iran growing, Vice Admiral Scott Stierney, apparently, by all reports, committed suicide. He was the commander of the Fifth Fleet, and he took his life at his home in Bahrain on the Persian Gulf. Why did he do it? Foul play is not suspected, but suicide certainly is. Now, the fact that this happened at this time, when the Stennis has arrived, when Iran is threatening to close down the Straits of Hormuz if it can't sell oil due to the American embargo. His suicide could not come at a worse time. Of course, the conspiracy theorists are having a field day. He knew things that he wished he didn't or that the government did not wish other people to know that he did know because of his position and he couldn't do anything about it. Therefore, he took his life. All kinds of conspiracies are mushrooming concerning and surrounding his death and his suicide. Some saying he was murdered, some saying he was driven to suicide intentionally uh, because of things that he knew. We don't know. What we do know is at the worst possible time strategically, he died and all the signs point to suicide. This week in prophecy, something absolutely incredible transpires in France. The Yellow Vest riots, working class people rioting against the French government due to outrageous tax increases, particularly on fuel. The French pay more than twice as much as Americans for a gallon of gasoline, over $5 a gallon, approximately $5.11 a gallon, approximately. Of course, it's denominated in euros. Macron's government, which is very low popularity, about 15% by some estimates, and no more than 30 by the best estimates, has had to back down on further tax increases in the face of these riots that were not only in Paris, but spreading to provincial France. Again, this was not the Muslim riots, of which France has experienced multiple times. These were not left-wing riots of which France has experienced multiple times. These were riots of working people, even of middle-class people, who are being financially squeezed by outrageous levels of taxation, particularly on fuel. How did this come about? Germany had an aggressive policy of renewable fuels for electrical consumption in homes and in businesses. The overwhelming mass, approximately 87% of Germany's energy comes from renewables, wind-driven turbines, etc. It is claimed that this is better environmentally, but the reality is something quite different. The sun does not always shine for solar, and of course, the windmills are not always driven. I'm in Holland, and there's windmills all over the place. You've never seen so many windmills as there are in Holland. Old ones that are scenic and picturesque, and new modern ones. And most of the time, the blades are stationary. Most of the time, the blades seem to be stationary. Uh, there are also environmental impacts that are negative that the greenies don't like to talk about, including 
its effect on migration patterns of birds and so forth. And the modern wind turbines are an eyesore. If you've ever driven in California on Interstate 10, when you get to Palm Springs, you'll see thousands of these. They're ugly, they're eyesores, they're expensive, and much of the time, they're not even spinning or generating anything, just rusting in the high desert. Where economically viable, they are a good ancillary source of electricity. T. Boone Pickin thought that the United States was an environmentally, or certainly meteorologically, much more favorable position than most countries, and we could economically get 20% of household electricity from wind-driven turbines in the Great Plains. He gave it up as a businessman. This is the reality. In Germany and in other countries that have pursued these renewables have still had to maintain fossil fuel systems of producing electricity because of the unreliability of most renewables. So you still have to mine the coal, you still have to have powerhouses, power stations, you still have to have those things. You're running two systems instead of one. This has created a financial crisis in the energy industry that could only be covered by taxpayer money. This resulted in astronomical levels of taxation in France to subsidize renewable energy, where the consumer can't get to work. Some people in France saying that they pay as much as two to two and a half months of their take home salary for petrol to get to work in the course of a year in order to fund renewable energy. Now, I'm not opposed to the principle of renewable energy when it can be economically viable. But its benefit to the environment in an age of smoke-free coal or smokeless coal and in an age of natural gas that burns clean is greatly, greatly overstated. Greatly overstated. Fuel prices will go through the absolute ceiling. What is taking place in France would have happened in the United States, of course, had the policies of Barack Obama been continued as she promised she would by Hillary Clinton. It didn't happen here, but it's happening in France. And today we have the reaction, this week, in prophecy. What is the prophetic significance of this? One, it shows that France cannot disentangle itself from Mid Middle East oil. And two, a blow to France is a blow to the European Union, Daniel chapter two. This week in prophecy, the United States has basically read the riot act to Russia, saying that Russia would have 60 days to comply with the INF Intermediate Range Missile Treaty from the 1980s. The Russians have been developing the SSC-8, also known as the Avitar 9M729 missile, which is a violation of the treaty as the United States interprets the treaty. Russia's response has been peculiar. It says, if the United States abrogates the treaty because of what Russia is doing, there will be ramifications and consequences. Russia is violating it, and Mr. Putin is saying that if you don't let us violate it, there's going to be consequences. But what they've also said is this, both sides have violated it. So they're not denying that they have violated it. What a confused mess. A confused mess indeed. The Saudi Arabians are cuddling up to Mr. Putin at the same time they're trying to introduce reforms and cuddle up to Mr. Trump and even to the Israelis. Whose friend do you want to be when the Russians are backing their arch enemy, Iran? Whose friend do you want to be?
it seems like there's no way out of it. The policies are contradictory, ultimately self-defeating. We are reminded of what the scripture says. There will be fear and anxiety among the nations, none of them knowing the way out. That has been This Week in Prophecy. My name is James Jacob Prash. God bless. Thank you for listening. Please continue to pray for Brexit and for the Trump administration. Pray for Christians who are being persecuted in China and Islamic countries. Please pray for the peace of Jerusalem and for the salvation of Arabs and Jews. Once again, thank you so much and God bless. Mm -hmm.